Um, we are in Colossians. The chapter is chapter number two, and we're going to start commenting on uh, verse uh, seven and, and following. Uh, so let me read. Um, let me read uh, six through um, through fifteen. Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him, rooted and built up in Him, and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God, who raised him from the dead. And you, who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven all us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us by its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. So therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. When Paul uses those words rooted and, and built up, they're metaphors. They're, they come from agriculture, they come from, from construction. And they point to someone or something that is firm, something that's enduring. And Paul prays that the faith of, of the Corinthians, or the Colossians here, be deeply rooted um, rooted in the good soil of God's word, not built on the sands. Um, and that's what's going to come up in verse 8. Not built on the sands of philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition, but rather built on the rock who is Christ. So Paul prays for a deep rootedness and that the Colossians be built up in him. So there's a firmness in the Christian faith that comes from being built up in the Word of God. It's a firmness not in the sense of being a, a, a sternness, but rather a, a firmness in that unwavering assurance that you have in Christ. So that when all the bad things that end up happening to us in life come along, and they always do, um, you're firm. Uh, you won't be toppled over, blown over in the wind. Or the, the sands, the, 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 the waves of the sea take the sand away from your building and you tumble. Uh, you don't tumble because your faith is rooted deep. Um, your faith is built well on Christ. And the way to be rooted and built up and established in the faith is by being in the Word. Um, as I think about it, you know, there are a lot of spiritual exercises that, that uh, we're encouraged to do, and some of them are very good. And uh, certainly there's, there's conferences to go to, and some of them are very, very good. And there's some absolutely fantastic books out there to read that are very, very good. And there are gurus, if you will, to listen to and on and so forth. But in the end, God works through his word. Uh, and so when, when you're in the word, the Word works. It's just the nature of the Word. It works. It's a living Word. It's not a dead Word. So God's Word was the center of what the Colossians had received. It was the center of what they had been taught. And it's the center of what you've received. It's the center of what you've been taught. And it's something that, you know, with all the things that come at us from all the different sides, that we use the Word as that touchstone so that we always know uh, what we're hearing and whether it's, whether it's um, you know, the, the, the sands of time or whether it's the rock of Christ. And Paul continues on, he says, just as you were taught. Um, in verse 8, he's going to warn against um, 
empty human tradition. And here Paul's encouraging the Colossians not to change, um, not to neglect the traditions that were handed over to them. And so when, when he says that, that the, you know, when I, when I say tradition, I simply mean that, that Christian doctrine that you ha- have learned. I think in our time, doctrine, the words doctrine and the words tradition get a real bum rap. Um, doctrine, I guess, is seen as something that keeps you from advancing. Tradition is something that keeps you from being able to move ahead in this life. So I was thinking about it. I was thinking, um, I think, I think doctrine or, 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 or tradition is kind of like an anchor on my boat. Um, it's not a bad thing that an anchor holds me back because it actually holds me back so I don't drift onto the rocks or get crushed in the surf. Um, it's okay to swing at anchor. Well, we swing a bit at anchor, um, but we don't drift away from what's, what's solid. Um, the tradition Paul's talking about here or the teaching that, that the Colossians have learned is like their anchor. And with their anchor firmly set in the word, oh, they can swing a little bit. There's a little bit of give back and forth, but never into an area of doctrinal danger, never onto the rocks of, 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 of heresy or something like that. Um, tradition uh, isn't a negative word in the scriptures. Um, Tradition encapsulates the entirety of that which the Lord has told us to keep watch over. All that I have taught you, when he talks about that uh, in at the very end of the Gospel of Matthew, all that I have taught you, um, that's the tradition, the, the doctrine that he taught. And and uh, there's a difference between human tradition and, and biblical tradition. It's, it's a, it's a false dichotomy if you, if you say, well, there's traditional and there's contemporary. Okay. Though that you, you, um, if you think about it, uh, that's a false dichotomy. It pits one against the other. Tradition includes all that Jesus has taught, all of Christian doctrine. Contemporary simply means that it needs to be understood by the people who are hearing it. Um, and so, What's important is that tradition and the way that it is worded, that those two things aren't saying something different when you do the translation. Um, that's why we're very careful about the songs that we sing, you know, the words, uh, whether they're, you know, uh, in the third service with the, with the uh, entire band or whether it's in the first service with the organ. We're careful about the songs that we sing. Very careful about that. Um, that the liturgy is is rightly worded. That that sermons get agonized over. That we wrestle with it. You know, somebody. Uh, I remember when I was in seminary. They, that we somebody asked uh, how how much time should you spend preparing for a sermon, and the response was for every minute you're in the pulpit, you spend an hour in preparation. You know, so if you figure if if you. Uh, you figure a 20-minute sermon, you got 20 hours in that week preparing the sermon. Now, you, you know, sometimes it comes easier than other times. I'll grant that. Um, and sometimes after 20 hours, you're still going, oh my gosh, this isn't going to work. Um, but nevertheless, it's something to be agonized over because you don't want the, the wording, the contemporary wording, because you have to understand it, be something that the tradition isn't saying. Um, therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. And then he gets to verse 8. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. Talks about philosophy and empty deceit. By philosophy, Paul's using that word very broadly. Paul here is not attacking Dr. Brandt back there in the back row. Well, or, that is what we try to do. Yes, right. <laughs> <laughs> or, or Dr. Yeah, Dean. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> um, now, now, perhaps you can uh, uh, philosophically uh, explain to us how you become a doctor of philosophy and philosophy. Isn't that PhD kind of in philosophy? Is that how that goes? But never mind. Yes, okay. <laughs> um, but uh, 
Paul's not talking about what Dr. Brandt and Dr. Dean are doing. What, what he's talking about are the variety of points of view, um, all the different abilities, uh, the, the academic things, the practical things. It's not bad to be a student of philosophy um, to understand the differences of all the, the world views out there. And it might even be helpful to parts of life. But what Paul's getting at is all of that is powerless on its own to explain God adequately. Um, so he's saying, don't be deceived, which is what the, the Gnostics were trying to do to the Colossians. Um, don't be deceived by empty deceit. And when he uses the word deceit, it's not limited to people who are purposely trying to deceive you. Um, it includes people. It includes in the idea that you can be very sincere about what you believe and be in error and lead other people astray. He's talking about that too. I'm sure that the Jehovah's Witnesses across the street are very sincere in their belief that Jesus Christ is not Lord and God. I'm sure they're very secure in that. But just because they believe it with all their heart, soul, mind, and body, so to speak, doesn't make them right and doesn't mean that they're not deceiving people when they go out door to door on their, on their excursions through your neighborhood. Um, so don't be taken by philosophy and empty deceit, human tradition. We just talked about that. Um, according to the elemental spirits, he says. And the elemental spirits, as we saw a little bit earlier, could be the basic, the, the, the basic elements of this fallen world. Scripture uses the word like that sometimes. Or it could mean the fallen angels, because he's been talking about, uh, angels in this, in this chapter as well, who, um, who are behind all of the false teaching, the fallen angels who are behind all the false teaching. Don't be taken and don't be deceived by them. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. Verse 9, For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. Um, we dealt with uh, the, the, this a little bit earlier, the deity uh, dwelling bodily in Christ, when we looked at um, Colossians chapter 1, verse 15. Um, fullness was one of those terms that the, the Gnostics were using. Okay? It, uh, it referred to the, the, the number of false divine beings that emanated from God. Perhaps the, 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 the angels and rulers and authorities and thrones and dominions that Paul gets, uh, that Paul refers to every once in a while. And so against this, Paul teaches that everything that is of God dwells in Christ. And Paul includes deity, uh, to make the point. Yes. I have a question over here. Yes. Oh, just, just a comment. The, the word that just pops out really strongly there is depends. Okay. In other words, the, the bad part is depending on all these things as though they had authority. Yeah, as though they had authority, yes. There's things we can learn from many different, uh, many different, uh, things, but, but not to depend on those for our relationship with Christ. He determines that one. Right. Very good. Yes. Yes. So, Whatever makes God to be God dwells in Jesus Christ and dwells in him bodily and dwells in him fully. Uh, that's why we confess in the Nicene Creed that Christ is very God of very God, being of one substance with the Father. He's fully God. And that's why our Lutheran confessions say, in this personal union, the two natures in Christ have such a grand, intimate, indescribable communion that even the angels are astonished by it. Um, no wonder we can't quite get our hands around it. Uh, the angels are astonished. Um, and this, it's not that was then and this is now. Uh, when it says dwells bodily, those words are in the present tense. So Christ continues to dwell with his human body as both God and man for all eternity. 
In other words, you can't separate the divine and the human Jesus and stick the human Jesus up there in heaven and the divine side of Jesus down here on earth. And so if his body then is in heaven, then he can't be with us in the Lord's Supper, right? You know, that, that's kind of the logic behind it, the, the, uh, the deceit, I would say. Not, not according to Paul. Um, wherever the second person of the Holy Trinity is, he is there with both of his natures intact. Um, and if you want more on that, then uh, I think most of those videos from Dr. Rosenblatt when he went uh, over the two natures in Christ are up on the, up on the web and to, to review those. Um, and if the fullness of God dwells bodily in Christ, that heresy that was being propagated in, in Colossae, that, that matter is evil, um, he, he's speaking against that. Because the matter that God created, um, he called good, and flesh is not evil, and, and the spirit is good. No, Jesus is God and man in one person. Verse 10, and you have been filled with him who is the head of all rule and authority. You've been filled in the sense of you have been completed. Um, in other words, Christians have all that they need when they're in Christ. When you're in Christ, you have all that you need. There's nothing more. There's no additional baptism in the Spirit. There's no secret knowledge that you have to pay either ancient or modern Gnostics for. There's no checklist that you have to make sure that you have covered so that you uh, can guarantee for yourself that you are better today than you were yesterday, that you're closer to Jesus now than you were uh, 20 minutes ago. You have everything that you need when you are in Christ. You have His righteousness his perfect righteousness, credited to you. It's yours. You have his holiness imputed to you, counted as yours. You have all that you need in Christ. And it's a fullness that is ours, not the day we die. It's a fullness that you have even right now. Wasn't a, a neat part of the sermon when Pastor Rody talked about King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and he's the King and he's the Lord, but who's the Lords and who's the Kings? You know, in Christ, we're the Lords and we're the Kings who reign with Him. Wow. Peter says the redemption accomplished by Christ makes us partakers of the divine nature since we are the body of Christ. He's the head, we're the body, and thus partakers of the divine nature. A couple quotes from, uh, first one from a man by the name of Martin Chemnitz. He wrote uh, the book that Dr. Rosenblatt uh, used to talk about the two natures in Christ. Um, some say that if uh, Martin Chemnitz hadn't come, come along, then we wouldn't have known the first Martin, Martin Luther. Um, but uh, Martin Chemnitz writes, All these blessings, I say, in perfect and complete fullness, we have in Christ, who for us became incarnate, was crucified and rose again, so that as from our head to us as members, all these blessings are distributed and flow and are given, uh, given as our help from his fullness. As a result of this, Paul concludes that there is no need of any other elements of the world for our salvation since we possess his fullness. In Christ. When you have Christ, you have it all. Um, and then one other rather lengthy quote from our Lutheran confessions. There, the, the Lutherans wrote the Augsburg Confession. Uh, the Roman Catholics responded uh, uh, to that. Uh, uh, with, uh, uh, and then the uh, Lutherans responded to their response in what was called the Apology, which is not, I'm sorry for being a Lutheran, but uh, it means a defense of what we what we confessed in the um, Augsburg Confession. This is what the Apology says, uh, Philip Melanchthon. Paul teaches this in Galatians 3.13 when he says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. The law condemns all men, but Christ, because without sin, he bore the punishment of sin 
and has been made a victim for us, has removed that, the right, that right of the law to accuse us and condemn those who believe in him, because he himself is the propitiation for them who, for whose sake we are now counted righteous. But since they are accounted righteous, the law cannot accuse or condemn them, even though they have not actually satisfied the law. Paul writes the same way to the Colossians. You have been filled, or you are complete, in him. As though he were to say, Although ye are still far from the perfection of the law, yet the remnants of sin do not condemn you, because for Christ's sake, we have a sure and firm reconciliation if you believe, even though sin dwells in your flesh. Um, you have been filled in Him. But then, to what can you point? To what can you point in order to say that you are in Him? And Paul answers that question in the next few verses. Look at verse 11 through 15. In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, by putting off the body of the flesh, by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God, who raised him from the dead. And you who were dead in your trespasses, and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven all uh, us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. So what I want to do here with those verses, I want to talk about three different things. I want to talk about circumcision, I want to talk about covenants, and I want to talk about baptism. So first, circumcision. Um, circumcision was a sign or the sign of God's covenant establishing the people of Israel. God had made a covenant with Abraham. He said, I will give you many descendants, I will give you land, and that you will be a blessing to all the families of the earth. Um, from uh, That's from Genesis chapter, tw- chapter 12, verse 3. I will bless... Um, yes. Um, now, God gave circumcision to Israel as a sign of the covenant. And so, every time you would see the sign, you would remember the covenant that God made with you. Now, the sign is not in a very public place, needless to say. But you end up seeing the sign several times a day. Now, there was no circumcision for women. um, But as a wife, they would see the mark of God's promise on their husband as through the woman, God would keep his promise of many descendants. Okay? So this sign set the Hebrews apart from all the pagan societies around them. Now, it's not that the pagan societies didn't circumcise. They did. But it's what God does with that promise. He puts, he puts a, a twist in it with his promise. The, when what we know about pagan circumcision uh, in, in, uh, in, in that day, especially the day of the children of Israel, um, pagan circumcised, the Canaanite circumcised. Uh, you were circumcised right before marriage to prove that you were ready to get married. Um, and your father-in-law would be the one who circumcises you. Yeah, no, we don't want to. Um, God, on the other hand, establishes circumcision on the eighth day. Your father did it. And there God marked his promise on you. You're part of the family. Well, the covenant that God made with Abraham, many descendants land, and to be a blessing to all the nations of the earth, all that was fulfilled in Christ. Um, And so, with the old covenant fulfilled, God cuts a new covenant. 
He cuts a new covenant with his new Israel. But it's a different kind of circumcision. It's one cut in the waters of holy baptism. So that's a little bit about circumcision. Um, the second thing has to do with covenants. There were a number of different kinds of covenants, but two, two key ones. One was a, was a human obligation covenant. A human obligation covenant is where God acts and then he calls for a response on your part. Uh, many of the Ten Commandments uh, are kind of like that. Honor your father and your mother, that it may be well with you, and you may live long in the land. If you don't honor your father and your mother, then you won't live long in the land. God calls for a response. That's a human, human obligation covenant. The divine commitment covenant is completely different. In a divine commitment covenant, God commits himself with an irrevocable promise to his people. And there is nothing that people can do in return. Um, there's, not, there's nothing to do. And that is illustrated in the, the, the covenant that God made with Abraham, uh, that, I, that I've talked about, land, descendants, and to be a blessing to the people of the earth. Um, it's also illustrated in Genesis chapter 15, where Abraham, where God makes a covenant. He cuts a covenant with, 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 with Abraham. Um, if you recall that chapter, uh, Abraham, uh, God makes this promise to Abraham. You will have land, descendants, uh, uh, land, um, many descendants, and be a blessing to the world. And then Abraham goes into a deep sleep, and, and God, uh, God tells him in that sleep to take uh, these halves, these, these animals, and cut them in half and spread them open. And then what Abraham sees is a smoking fire pot that, that is God passing between the, the animals, okay? Passing between these two animals, these animals that have been cut in half. The way uh, covenants would work back then was uh, you and I have a boundary dispute. Okay, Paul and I have this boundary dispute. And we finally make a, a, a resolution. This is, this is the boundary right here, okay? All right. And so after we've decided that that's what it really is, okay, then you'll go get an animal of yours. I'll go get an animal of mine. We'll cut it in half, all right? And then you'll take your animal, spread it apart, and I'll take my animal, we'll spread it apart, and you and I will both walk between the halves of the animals. And what we're saying by that, by the cutting of this covenant, what we're saying is, Paul, if I move the boundary toward you, you have my permission to cut me in half, just as we did these animals, okay? And now you move it my way, and it goes that way as well. All right, so just remember, you want to be cut in half, just play with the boundary. Okay, all right, all right. Paul and I would pass between the halves of the animals, in this vision that, that Abraham had. Abraham didn't go between the halves of the animals. Only God did. Only God did. And it's like God was saying, you can do to me what we did to the, what, I, what you did to these animals if I break my promise to you. I will just not exist if I don't keep my promises. <laughs> All right, that's a divine commitment covenant. It depends only on God. Um, and so in regard to, to covenants, there are two different types of covenants, the human obligation covenant and the divine commitment covenant. And the promise that God made to Abraham uh, and the promise that God has made to you in Christ is a divine commitment covenant. Um, and finally, uh, baptism, because all this ties together in baptism. This section, if you will, gives us a little theology on, on holy baptism. Uh, I won't reread it. You've got it in front of you, uh, if you have your Bibles open. But first note the comparison. Um, there's a correlation between circumcision and baptism. Circumcision and the circumcision done without hands. Okay, that's what Paul's talking about when he's talking about baptism. If Jewish boys were circumcised on the eighth day, um, uh, you know, we, we get kind of a timing here. If Jewish boys were circumcised on the eighth day, and then you became your Jewish family and you become a believers in Christ, 
who you, you come to believe that Christ is the Messiah. He's the Christ, the Son of the living God. He's Lord and God. Um, then you have another child and you read Paul talking about that, that in him, in Christ, you also were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by the putting off of the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. When do you think you baptize that baby that you just had? You baptize that baby on the eighth day. Whether grandma could get there or not, whether it was a Sunday or a Thursday, whether it was Christmas or Easter, the eighth day is the day you baptized. Baptism replaces Jewish circumcision. Okay? And we know that as a fact from history. Um, the, the church from the very beginning was baptizing babies on the eighth day. Um, baptismal fonts were built with eight sides to them. Eight because eight was the, was the number. You can make too much of numbers, you can make too little of numbers, but eight was the number for Christ in the early church. Three is a, one is a number for God, three is a number for, for the heavens, four is a number for the earth, the earth has four winds as you know, um, uh, seven is a number of completeness, the heavens and the earth, just shy of completeness is six. And then you want to have a, a complete number of incompleteness, you get six, six, six. All right. Um, the number for Christ is eight. He died on the sixth day. He rested on the seventh day. He rose on the eighth day, the first day of the new week. So you were baptized into Christ, into, in, into him. And so baptisms took place on the eighth day. We know Jesus was circumcised on the eighth day. Luke tells us that. Paul tells us that he was circumcised on the eighth day. The early church circumcised on the eighth, or baptized on the, on the eighth day. And so if you need to make points of comparison, you don't compare Jesus' baptism and Christian baptism. That's not the comparison. The comparison, at least according to Paul, is circumcision and baptism. Um, the picture comes up with baptism being a new birth as well. Um, and if you think about that, um, what did you do to get yourself conceived? <laughs> did your parents ask you before you even conceived, would you like to come into this world? What did you do to become, uh, to get, to be born? As I understand the, the, my nurses would have to tell me, but I think it's the mom who says, that's it. It's time to be pushed out. And the baby, you know, uh, it's time. You're not asked, would you like to be born now? Would you like another wait another month before you come into this cruel world? Um, no, you're just pushed out into this world. Um, and uh, what did you do to become a child of God? Nothing. He chose you. Um, so what happens in baptism, Paul says here? We can get a little bit of a theology here. We won't be able to get through it all. Um, first, there's a putting off of the body of the flesh. In him you were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Um, and then later on he's going to talk about uh, in Colossians and also in Galatians, there's a putting off and there's a putting on as well. Now, when Paul uses these words, um, putting off, he's probably uh, trying to get in there a little dig against the Gnostics. Um, the false teachers, who probably held circumcision in high regard, talked about the putting off of the evil flesh. You know, escaping the, the influence of, of, of the material world, which they regarded as inherently evil. And Paul's little dig here is their circumcision didn't cut off much flesh, and maybe you want to snip off some more and make yourself even less physical and more spiritual. Uh, just a small little dig there. But um, he does it another time in Scripture as well. Um, the false teachers, uh, Paul says, your circumcision didn't put off much flesh. Just a little bit. Um, but holy baptism, the circumcision made without hands, puts off the whole body of the flesh. And perhaps there, there's a comparison also again with circumcision in that it is a one-time act. There's no multiple circumcisions. There's no multiple baptisms. 
um, there's a putting off of the body of the flesh. And so, as one of our commentators said, the picture that we can get here is the flesh has been removed from its throne of ruling the body and its members, making them serve the lusts of the flesh at the behest of the flesh. Now the spirit occupies the throne and the body and its members obey the spirit. That's true enough. This flesh is still lurking around. It's seeking to usurp the throne. But uh, for us as God's people, it succeeds only in making our members sin here and there. Um, But it's Christ's throne and he reigns there. Um, Some of the commentators also talked about this whole putting off of the flesh gave rise to the practice in baptism where um, you uh, you went down into the waters of baptism um, completely naked. You put off the, 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 the dirty robes and were baptized um, in, in, in the water and then raised up out of that water and a new robe wrapped around you. Um, I tell this story when I talk about baptism with, with uh, families. And uh, there was a tribe of Indians in South America who um, were taught by the Jesuits and so when, when the baby is born in this tribe, when the baby was born, the father would go out and make a casket for the baby. I've been around adult caskets, okay? And it's rattling enough. To be around a casket for an infant is a whole different animal, okay? And then to be the dad of the baby and go out and make a casket for your baby would be extremely hard. And then that casket is brought to the church. And the baby in his or her dirty clothes is lowered down into the casket in the liturgy of baptism. The robes are taken off. The dirty clothes are taken off the baby. The baby is baptized. Water poured over the baby uh, in, in the casket. And the baby lifted out of the casket, dripping wet with the waters of holy baptism. And then a new baptismal garment is wrapped around that baby. It's Romans chapter 6. You'd never forget that as long as you live. Your baby going into a casket, you go into a casket when you die. And in baptism, we died with Christ. And in baptism, we are raised with Christ. And then the robe of Christ's righteousness wrapped around us. Christ's righteousness credited as ours. Um, All this happens um, by the circumcision of Christ, he says. Um, Not Christ's circumcision, not... And some others uh, talk about... uh, Paul's talking about here, he says... uh, uh, It it means his death. No, um, no. By the circumcision of Christ means by the circumcision that he inaugurated in holy baptism. So the first thing is the body of flesh has been put off in the waters of baptism. And then next he says, you have been buried with Christ and you have been raised with Christ. In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. I'm going to end at that point. We will we'll pick it up. I'll fill in a little bit more on the on buried in Christ and raised with Christ uh, next week. The Lord be with you. Thank you.